This morning's lesson is a request lesson. I enjoy request lessons because that means that somebody else wants to hear a particular lesson that you want to talk about. It'd be sad if you're the only one who wants to hear you preach on a certain subject. And so you know at least that somebody else wants to hear a lesson along this line. And so hopefully uh, what we can do this morning will be something that will help fulfill what the person had requested concerning this particular topic. Brother Larry dealt with it in his prayer. He talked about love, and so we want to talk about love. Now, you talk about a general topic, that's certainly one. You can go a lot of directions with all of that. And so this morning, the, what I want to do, and if you've read your bulletin article, it, you can probably be uh, kind of aware of what's going on with, uh, with the lesson this morning. We'll talk some about uh, our love and God's love. And I'll probably reverse it in that order in the bulletin, but we'll probably look some at our love or the love we're commanded to have. And then we'll take also a time to look at God's love, the love that God wants us to have uh, exhibited by, by what he has done, by what Jesus has done. And so it's a lesson that's uh, not one that will be uh, possessive, uh, incredible new information you've never heard before in your life, but it's a reminder type lesson. And so we look forward to it, presenting it this morning. Speaking of that particular topic of love, we realize there are several words, and I won't go through them all in the original language, uh, two in particular that we deal with. One, of course, uh, philia or friendship love, and that's a wonderful love, isn't it? All of you here have people who are some of your best friends, and I've always, um, I guess in a certain way, been a little bit envious of those who've been able to be in, a, in one area for all of their life, for years and years, and have friends that go back for uh, 40 or 50 or 60 years and uh, sometimes in doing funeral services, I've noticed that you'll have a speaker who gets up and who talks about his friend and, and how long he has known this person over the last 50 years. And, and I don't have too many of those friendships like that. I have a lot of friends. I'm thankful for them. But I've moved around a lot, so I don't get to enjoy what some people have had along that line. But isn't that wonderful to think about somebody you've been friends with for 50 or 60 years or longer? And I uh, said, there are husbands and wives who've been friends that long even, too. So <laughs> that's good. And so that's good. But friendship love. I'm not aware in the Bible of scriptures where we are commanded to have friendship love uh, for everybody because that would probably be impossible. I don't know that we have the emotional capacity to do that, to be able to be friends with everybody. And there might be some that we just don't have things in common with, and so it might be more difficult because of that. But there is another love that's even superior to that that all of us as Christians are commanded to have. And that's what's referred to as agape love. That's the highest form of love. And sometimes it's been referred to as unconquerable benevolence. That word unconquerable is an interesting term. You might think about maybe some uh, sports team that seems to be unconquerable or some military group that seems to be unconquerable. Yet we've realized over the years that uh, well, there's no such thing as a sports team or an individual that's unconquerable or a military that can't be conquered because many that have prided themselves in such a way uh, have indeed gone down to defeat. But unconquerable benevolence, uh, that's, that's something that we're commanded to have by one who, of course, was the most benevolent that there ever could be as we look at Jesus. And he's the one who gives that command. And one of those places is John 13, 34, 35. It starts out talking to his disciples, and he says, a new commandment I give to you. Well, I know at this point they probably were, were thinking, well, this, this is interesting. And he said to us, there are many other things I want to share with you, but you're not able to bear them now. So maybe it's one of those things. He's going to give us some deeper information now. But no, he just says that you love one another, that you love one another. Well, that doesn't sound new. I mean, Jesus has been preaching that the entire time of his ministry with his disciples. But no, he says, as I have loved you, that you have loved one to another. And then he says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And so that's an interesting thing Jesus says. And, and it's been brought out before, of course, that Jesus didn't say, by the fact you take the Lord's Supper, everybody will know that you love one another. Or by the fact that you are the ones who sing without using instrumental music, everybody will know that, uh, you, know, that you are my disciples. But by the fact you love one another, he says, that's, that's how people will know that you are my disciples. And so that, that kind of incredible love, that un unconquerable benevolence, is what Jesus is commanding for us to have at this point. And that's, uh, that's a wondrous thing as we stop and contemplate that. In fact, it might be one of those things when you, you first hear about it, you might just say, well, I, I don't know that I can do all of that. I'm not sure I'm able to. Because he's the great example for that. And he's the one who had that type of unconquerable love for those who were mean to him, who mistreated him. Uh, he still dies on the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I may remind us of that again at the end of the lesson. 
But what a wonderful command that is, that we, that we just love one another as the family of God. And there are other verses, too, that deal with the same principle. Romans 12 and verse 10, that passage says that we are to be kindly affectioned toward one another as the family of God. And, you know, we sing that song, we're part of the family that's been born again, part of the family whose love has no end. And so uh, when you look at, at Christians, there is to be this incredible affection that we have for one another. And you know what I think of when I think about affection? Now, this seems strange, maybe. I think about a puppy dog. You know, you come home at the end of the day, and, and you've got this dog, and this dog meets you at the door, and she's just jumping up in the air, and so excited. And you're thinking, why is this dog so excited? What has caused her or him to just, just be just elated about the fact that I've come home? And it wouldn't matter if you had a good day or a bad day, or if that dog has a good day or a bad day. I don't know what it's like when dogs don't have a good day. It seems like a fairly good life to me. But this dog is just so excited. And uh, just they want to lick you, and then they're wagging their tails, and they're just so thankful that you come home. Well, now God created animals, and he created animals that could be domesticated like dogs could be. But it's almost like he's giving us an illustration there you know, when you talk about affection. Because the dog is not questioning you concerning your day or why did you get home so late or anything along that line, but it's just so excited to see you. And as Christians, we should have affection. And we shouldn't be licking one another, don't be doing any of that, you know. But, but nonetheless, but we should, have, we should have affection when we walk through that door. And, that, and hey, there you are, you know, and good to see you. And I mean, we mean it too, you know. It's just really good to see you because we're the family of God. Kindly affection to one another. And so that, that's something that, as Christians that we are reminded of. And it's not a forced thing. We want to explore that in a minute also. But it's something that we just naturally have when you think about the family of God. You know, I think about the, the work of ministry and what a wonderful work that is. Because one of the things about it, you talk about there's a lot of perks with ministry. But one is you are surrounded by the greatest people in the world to work with. And I've worked some in factories and I've worked some in situations where not those, those people don't all exist out there. You have some very difficult individuals to work with, but not in the Lord's church. The Lord's church is like a, just a taste of heaven when you are part of the family of God. It's just a wonderful place to be. Love to be a part of the Lord's church. Every Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, it's just great to be a part of the family of God. And so it's a natural response to us to be thankful for that and, and thus be filled with affection for one another. And if, well, if I don't have that, you know, I've got to look at me and I've got to think, I wonder if, if I'm the problem along that line. Maybe there's some change I need to make in my life to be a different person and be pleasing in God's sight. That kind of love, talking about love, extends toward our service toward one another. In Galatians 5 and verse 13 says that very thing, by love, serve one another. And as, as we're thinking about that, of course, Jesus, the, the, the master of love, gives us this great example of service in John 13 by washing the disciples' feet. I, I don't know that we'll ever fully appreciate what something like that must have been after people have been walking around all day long and uh, in the dirt and the sand and, and then you have Jesus just without one moment's hesitation goes and, and he washes the disciples' feet. Well, we, we don't have to do much of that today, washing people's feet, and we don't have foot washing services, anything along that line. We would, uh, if, if there's an example of it in the Bible where you saw the early Christians doing that as part of their worship, of course we would. We want to do what the Bible teaches. We don't find that. But we sure do find a lot of opportunities to serve one another as Christians. And it's just an absolute joy to, to serve other Christians and not think in terms of, well, let's see, I owe them one, so I better do something. But just because we just love to serve. And there are some wonderful people. Everybody here is a wonderful person in this congregation. But in this congregation, there are people who love to serve. They are just glad to do that. And we don't even know half of what's being done. I don't. I, I'm not aware of all the different ways that you serve during the week. And I just offer a challenge to every one of us as Christians. Whatever we're doing, let's see if we can even do more along that line. And as we do that, to have an attitude of love as we serve. It sort of reminds me of parents and the way that they do with their children. You don't find parents uh, who grudgingly serve their children, but they're glad to do it. 
And then for children, as they also reciprocate for their parents, especially as they get older, it's just a joy for them to serve in that way and to help out their parents. And so that kind of love goes uh, for all of us, that we want to serve one another. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.12, we abound in love. It's just something we are known for. It makes an impact on people. And whoever started that saying years ago, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, was on the ball. They were right about that. Some of our most successful efforts are just centered around just loving people in the church. Disaster relief program, which has given away millions of dollars, especially throughout the southern part of the United States, the Gulf Coast area, and have never asked for anything in return. They just want to do that. They just abound in love. They abound in love. Uh, the work that is done by programs such as our, our Panama Medical Mission works and trips that are done, those are just centered around giving, giving to people, helping people out. I knew of a group that was going to Jamaica on one occasion. A doctor was leading the group. They were giving away over a half a million dollars worth of medicine. And they were stopped in customs because someone wanted them to pay that amount of money to go through customs. And the doctor said, well, look, I, we want to be as kind and do things as right as we know how to do, but I'm not going to pay you a half a million dollars to give away a half a million dollars worth of medicine to your people free of charge. And so they contacted the president of Jamaica at that time, Mr. Siaga. And he said, let those people go through. At first, he couldn't believe it. You know, it's like, you mean these people are wanting to give away a half a million dollars of medicine to my people here? And you're trying to detain them in customs? Send them on through. He couldn't believe it at first, but he was overwhelmed by that. And basically said, anytime churches of Christ want to come through, send them on through because they, all they want to do is give. And they give because they love. And when they do the works down in Panama, they don't do that seeing what they can get back in return, other than, oh, it would be a joy to see someone obey the gospel, and they will teach the gospel, but they just want to give. And I, I know I've watched this in my family, that, you know, my children, just anything they can do to get down there. They just want to be involved so much in that work. And they've watched other people who have done that work, and they've it's taught them so much about life and about love and the abundance of love. So we are to abound in love. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. It's what we are to be known for here in this congregation as Christians, that they abound in love. See how they love one another. I want to be a part of a group like that. I want to be a part of a group that's filled with that much love, and I know you do too. 1 Peter 1, 22. Peter gives a very important qualification, though. And he says there that we should have a love that's with a pure heart fervently. There's two things he stresses inside that verse. A pure heart, which I'm always aware of that, and I sing the song, Pure in heart, oh God, help me to be, and so I want to be pure as I live the Christian life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Matthew 5 and verse 8. But also fervently, uh, intensely. My brothers and sisters in Christ mean so much to me that I don't want anyone to put them down. I will defend them. I'll defend them like a mom defends her children. And that's some strong defense right there. You don't get between a mom and her children. You try it sometime, and you're going to go to war. And so uh, that's how I defend my brethren. And I don't mean by that that it's if there's faults and problems and sins, I just try to gloss over it. That's not right. But I'm talking about we, we stand up for one another. You know how it is in your family. Somebody can talk about your brother or sister, and they're going to have a problem with you. Now, you may say some negative things about them, but that's okay, because they are your brother or sister. But you don't want someone putting them down. And, oh, you can just feel the hair on the back of your neck bristle up, and the tension and blood pressure goes up, and your face gets red, because you just don't want someone picking at one of your brothers or sisters, or your mom or dad, or your son or daughter. You just don't want that. Transfer that over to the Lord's church, brethren, to where we feel that way about one another. And I will, I will fight for you. I'll go to war for you because I love you so much and I'm not going to stand around and gossip about you. I'm not going to listen to idle gossip about you. But I want to stand up for you and, and have a pure heart fervently, intensely. And also that that's sincere... It's also found in the same verse, 1 Peter 1, 22. The word sincere literally means without wax. Most of us here know the background behind that, that term. In case you don't, 
Here's how it works. Going back to the first century time, if you were to create a product, a crafted product, you'd worked on for a long time. This piece of pottery, maybe. You've just worked on it, worked on it. And it's just a beautiful piece of material. And you want to sell it. You may advertise in the first century that your product is sincere, which means without wax. And what that means is what you see is what you get. I have not taken this thing and, and found out that it had cracks in it problems with it, put in some untempered mortar and tried to find a way to foist it off upon somebody so I can get rid of this product, knowing that it's an inferior product. Instead, this is a good product. I've worked on it painstakingly. If it didn't do right, I broke the whole thing down, started all over again, and made sure that I had it right. Sincere without wax. That's how we are as Christians. Indeed, what you see is what you get. And we've got to be that way. There's not a choice in something like that. I cannot come to church on Sunday and look nice and smell nice and eat the Lord's Supper and do all those things and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, and go out and live a different way. One of those kinds of, during the week, one of those lives has got to be lived, uh, got to be uh, let go of. Uh, I cannot be involved in a spiritual schizophrenia. You know, I'm going to have to be a sincere Christian every day of the week. And if I'm not doing that, I've got to be down on my knees in prayer saying, God, can you help me become that kind of person? I must be that way. I must be sincere as I have love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I can't be uh, hugging them and saying, I love you and it's good to see you, brother, good to see you, sister. And then as soon as they walk out of the room, I talk about them behind their back. This is something that must not be allowed in the camp of Christianity. It must be expelled from it. And I've got to expel that spirit from myself if I have it. It's an unfeigned love. And I realize the love I have, it all springs forth from God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, love is of God. I wouldn't know how to love were it not for God. Uh, because I'm made in His image, He has taught me about it. He has created inside of me that ability to, to know how to love. And we thank Him for that. And then the last part of the lesson centers around God's love for us. And that is exhibited in oh, so many places. Where would you go to to see the exhibition of that incredible love? Uh, where do you begin on that? One passage uh, that we look at has, has been the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. The story that, that's just one of the different parables that are found there of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But you see the love of that father. And that father represents God as he sees his prodigal son come back home and he's so excited and he hugs him and he kisses him and, and he welcomes him home, kills the fatted calf, they have a big party. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. I may not always have that kind of love like I should have. you got this elder brother who wasn't happy when the prodigal son came home. And there are individuals who may not be happy whenever we have different members of the Lord's church that are part of our flock or who have come back to the Lord. But that father was excited about having that son come home. And that love he has is an incredible love. We get that from God, and God loves us. And it wouldn't matter if I'd been out of the church 30, 50 years, and I come back home to God. If you've not been living right in your life, and you want to come back home to God, He will take you back in today. And He will love you. And He will be glad to have you back in His fold, in a place of safety. Don't ever hesitate. It would, oh, it would break my heart to know there was somebody inside a congregation who wanted to come forward, who wanted to have prayer and say, look, I need prayer because my old heart has gotten like a big piece of rock. It's like a millstone, and I'm wanting something to break it apart. Would you people pray for me only to hold back and not come forward because they're afraid they won't love me? Maybe they don't want me to come forward. Maybe they don't have time for me to come forward. Yes, we do, and God does. And that's God's incredible love that is pictured just in Luke 15. He always has time for his children. He's always filled with love. One that melts my heart is also John chapter 8. In John 8, a woman there was taken in the very act of adultery, and she was made a, a spectacle, just humiliated. People standing around her, those Pharisees, they super self-righteous individuals, and pointing their fingers at her and disgust. You know, she was just nothing but trash as far as they were concerned. And then they were using her to get at Jesus. 
and we know the story so very well. And they are saying, you know, a person like this has committed adultery. The Bible says, the Old Testament law, that this person ought to be stoned. And what do you think about it? Well, Jesus is supposed to be caught in a dilemma. You know, what will he do? If he says, let her be stoned, uh, go along with the law of Moses because she has committed adultery. And it looks like the evidence was fairly strong along that line with that allegation. Well, then you're breaking the law of Rome because Roman law wouldn't allow the people of uh, Israel, the Judean people, to take someone's life like that. They didn't have the right to do that. They're under the auspices of the Roman government. So you're breaking that law. On the other hand, if you disregard Moses' law and say, well, no, you can't kill somebody. I know that may be what uh, the law says, but we're not going to go along with that today. Well, then you're breaking Moses' law. So what will he do? Well, you know what he does. He, he writes something in the dirt. It's katagraphane is the word that's used. It means writing down something in the dirt. And then he makes that challenge and says, whoever is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And, of course, everybody leaves from the oldest down to the youngest. Then he looks up at the woman and says, where are your accusers? And she says, no man condemns me. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go your way and sin no more. Gives that great challenge to her. These people saw a woman who was worthless. Jesus saw someone who was worth everything. And his love for her was so great that he did not mind being criticized by all those individuals. He went to bat for her. When I look at my life, I remind myself of that woman in John chapter 8. I look at my life and I don't see how God could love me so much. I don't understand how it could be. I don't understand how Jesus could love me like he does. I will never understand that as long as I live. And the old devil says, look at all the things wrong with Mike Fox. Oh, I've got a catalog on him. And, and he does on you too, brothers and sisters. Every one of us. He's got all kinds of things on a list where we've done wrong or where we've not done the things that we should do, you know, that we're right. doesn't matter either way. We'll explore that a little bit tonight in our lesson this evening. But any way you look at it, he's got you. He's, he's nailed you. And he's got a strong case he can plead against you. He's the ultimate prosecuting attorney. And here's Jesus over in the other corner, the Lamb of God with those nail-scarred hands. And he says, now you wait a minute here, accuser. Well, that's what his name means. He's the accuser. I know this person too. You know, this person gave their life to me years ago. They obeyed the gospel. I watched this person be immersed into Christ. And it may have been in a lake somewhere, in a baptistry somewhere. It may have been an ocean or a bathtub. I don't care. I saw them complete their obedience. I've watched them go to church. I've listened to them pray. Yes, they are weak. Yes, they make mistakes. But, Father, I died for that person. And they love me. And I love them. I want them to be in heaven with me. I want them to enter the joys of their Lord, which is me. And can you do that, Father? Will you be able to make that work out for me? And you know that he will. That's the love our Savior has. And then the ultimate love, as was prayed about by Brother Larry just a few moments ago, Jesus dying on a cross of Calvary, where his, his flesh is cut to ribbons by that scourge, as that flagellum rips into his flesh and you see the blood spraying in the air as his skin is, is stretched, uh, as his hands probably placed around a column post and his, his skin on his back stretched real tight. And then that flagellum lashed against it, lashed against it by a big, strong Roman soldier who could swing that flagellum hard. And then our Savior has a crown of thorns. You ever seen a crown of thorns? have a good, real close preacher friend that has a crown of thorns that he brings sometimes as an object illustration and lets people pass it around the room. He has to give instructions. Parents, watch this as your children get it. You can get cut in a moment with this crown of thorns. And so be careful with it. <laughs> that was crushed upon our precious Savior's head. And then he's dying on this cross and he's suspended between heaven and earth. And he is rejected by both. And as he dies on that cross... Rather than being vituperative, rather than lashing out at all of his accusers and filled with hatred and venom, instead he prays that beautiful prayer, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He prayed that for me. He prayed that for you. Praise God. I can't explain it. 
I don't understand it, but I sure do love it. And I'm thankful for that. I know you are too. This morning, as we think about God's love for us, will you have that love for one another too? Please do that. Tender-hearted, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another if there's a problem along that line. As God through Christ forgave me, even me. Ephesians 4, verse 32. This morning, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, if you need to put Christ on in baptism, or come back to our Lord and our precious Savior, we invite you to come to Him now with all the love in our heart as we stand and as we sing together.